you know, I've, I've been an advocate of universal basic income. When, when I first started my plan, we said $1,200 a month, $400 per child. And what came, what was the first payment that came out of uh, Congress? $1,200 a month, not $400 a child, but $1,200 a month. And then when the pandemic struck, I came out with a proposal for emergency universal basic income. $2,000 a month per adult, $1,000 per child. And now Congress is actively talking about $2,000 a month. We need to have a UBI all the way through the pandemic and the ensuing uh, depression or recession that's gonna follow it, and then switch to a full-time UBI of $1,200 per adult, $400 per child from then on. So you envision some type of universal basic income in perpetuity? Yes, ma'am. That's why I was endorsed by Andrew Yang and Humanity Forward. I've got uh, a guy named Scott Santens from the World Economic Forum who's helped me draft my plan. And uh, the reason that my numbers match those that are coming out of Congress is because there's a math behind them. And uh, because we've done the math, we can implement it and we can pay for it. So would you be for everyone, regardless of income, having a universal basic income or should there be some income thresholds? Nope, that's why, the, that's the univer that's universality and universal basic income goes to everybody. No checks. No, even the even the one percenters, even the one percenters will claw that back in taxes. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom, some would say, if it's all about trying to equalize uh, income inequality, that giving uh, that bump of money to those who really don't need it doesn't make much sense. Your response would be, well, if it's about equalizing someone who's a who's that one percent isn't even going to feel it. But somebody who's living in poverty, who's now dragged out of poverty, they're absolutely gonna feel it. If you're talking about incremental good, who's gonna have, Bill Gates is not gonna care about that $1,000, but somebody living in, in poverty is gonna have incredible change in their life. Critics would say that it equates to a handout and that it would disincentivize, disincentivize work. Your response to that criticism? Well, it, it's just not true, it doesn't happen. You know, there is a, uh, a program just like this in Alaska, and no one would say, and, and it's been in effect for 30 years, no one would say that Alaskans are lazy and don't go to work. And every single place this has been tried is not proven to be a disincentive to labor at all. People, people's lives are just dramatically improved. And here's the best part about it. When I talk to people in the country, my neighbors are all farmers, but they farm in the headlights of their pickup trucks and their tractors because they love to farm, but they gotta have another job. But if you say to them, how different would your life be if you had $1,200 a month? You can just see the light come up in their eyes and the gears start turning. And I'll tell you what they would do. They would farm full time because they love farming and it's important to them. They feed their community, they're good wardens of the, they're good wardens of the soil, they're good for the environment. Some Kentuckians would say this is exactly what we fear, another plank in the socialist agenda that most Kentuckians would rebuke. Well, it, you know, if we're gonna give money to anybody, here's a choice, we give it to corporations or we give it to people. You give money to people, to the middle class, <coughs> to the working class, the working poor, they spend that money. They spend it locally and it develops tremendous velocity and it gets spent over and over and over. You give money to a rich person, you give it to a corporation like we did back in 2009 with the airline industry, we gave them $50 billion and they use $45 billion to buy back their own stock and enrich themselves. Mr.